<laughs> is that a window above the chair or is that a painting? It's a, it's a window in the back of the room and I just put a poster of my favorite painting in it. And I, oh, I see. you're the first to notice, Phil. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's kind of like a window, but kind of like a painting. And I, yeah. <laughs> He's even okay. checking out your stuffed animals in the chair, I heard. Oh, well, you know, you can pin people's video and then you can like see up close. So yeah, that's, that's a big thing with middle schoolers. My son yeah. did that the whole time. He'd pin videos and do screenshots and like check out people's houses. It's a little creepy. <laughs> you know, I don't know if uh, Tim has emailed you guys any of this, but there's a guy on Twitter who his whole shtick is he takes screenshots of people's bookshelves and then he critiques them in this incredibly analytical way about the aesthetics and the books. And, you know, this person's trying way too hard. They probably didn't read those three books. And, and it's, it's really elaborate, but. Yeah, that's why I have anyway. no books behind me. Right. No books. <laughs> so welcome everybody. Uh, Tuesday, June 16, Senate Education remote hearing. And we're joined today by Secretary of Education, Dan French for an update on school reopening. Um, this was encouraged by the administration uh, the day you did your press conference that we hear from you. Um, so uh, we've scheduled as much time as you like, Secretary French, but uh, I remember your last presentation, there were a sequence of options that you were considering, but there wasn't a lot of detail yet. So whatever you can offer it by way of detail would be much appreciated. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you an update. Uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Um, the cornerstone of our um, reopening plans uh, are, are the, the guidance, is the guidance that we'll be releasing this week uh, jointly with the Department of Health on the uh, basically the public health um, guidance uh, that'll be the cornerstone of other planning that we undertake. Um, that guidance is fairly comprehensive. Um, it's going to be over 25 pages. Very specific. And we found uh, certainly uh, the CDC has produced some fairly general guidance, I would say, what we call considerations for schools. Um, but like many states, we've had to work to translate that into very specific um, guidance for the field. We have uh, a group that's been working on that, uh, led by the Department of Health, includes uh, the various uh, education stakeholder groups uh, augmented uh, by the School Nurses Association um, and several members of the Vermont, larger Vermont medical community, including folks from the Medical Center, pediatricians and so forth. So it's it's been a, I would say a very intensive sort of sprint, if you will, to produce the guidance, but I'm, I'm pleased with its quality and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have that out uh, probably tomorrow, if not um, mm -hmm. Thursday. So, um, and that guidance covers the wide range of activities uh, from hygiene to um, you know, say distancing in the classroom and so forth. Um, and I expect this will be, I say, the cornerstone of our planning efforts. There's, this will precipitate the need for other planning and uh, guidance uh, that will no doubt uh, emerge as the field responds to this initial guidance. Uh, we are already spinning up a group on um, applying this guidance to a specific situation for special needs students. So that would be a, a separate sort of sub guidance, if you will, in the same container or theme of public health guidance. Uh, we also know um, continuity of learning will be necessary in the, in the fall. So uh, districts uh, will be asked to embellish and, and continue to improve on their efforts to provide remote learning to students. Um, and then we have a couple other subcontainers that are basically based on the national models that emerged that we have uh, some guidance we'll be producing for school boards on issues relative to policy procedure, uh, administrative procedures in particular, um, funding considerations at the local level, how to align their funding strategies. Um, and we also know, uh, I think there's gonna be a whole bunch of guidance relative to social emotional supports for students and families. So I think you know the containers are shaping up in terms of the larger uh, guidance that we'll be producing, but it's important that we get this health guidance out first. Uh, we're also contemplating uh, a fairly, I think, significant communication strategy to uh, engage with uh, the broader Vermont community about the guidance, because I think it's going to require a partnership with parents, families, and so forth. 
Um, I will say uh, we're also keeping an eye on uh, what will no doubt be the financial needs for districts to implement the guidance as they get ready for the fall. So we can, we can be happy to talk with you a little bit about that today as well. Um, and also uh, keeping an eye on any uh, regulatory or statutory changes, modifications, and so forth that might be of interest to um, set up a good launch in the fall. In particular, issues surrounding uh, attendance and school calendar um, are ones we're surfacing pretty early in our, in our conversations. Why don't I stop there and I'll be happy to uh, delve into any of these topics in more detail. Okay. Um, so I, I, I can't remember if it was exactly your presentation or if I'm adding in presentations I've heard from other districts, but it seemed to me that there were three basic approaches. Um, one was all remote, one was a hybrid system, and one was having all the kids back in. Am I right that your guidelines would allow districts to move between those three? And so what you would be doing in effect is providing them ways that they might individually at any given time be satisfying the guidelines, whether in, they're in one, two or three mode? Yeah, I think, you know, it's fair to say that was one of the primary lenses we were looking as we were starting to admire this planning process and the various complex elements involved. Uh, we decided, however, to really, out of simplicity, even though I will argue it's 25 pages of simplicity, uh, to start with the public health considerations for opening school is sort of the beginning, because I think from there we'll start to precipitate every other aspect, including what I'd call the instructional dispositions that schools should be ready to embark upon, including, as you mentioned, in-person instruction on the other end of the continuum remote learning, and then what we call something like hybrid learning, which might be a case where a district would be doing both in-person instruction and remote learning simultaneously. Uh, but we, we are not directing anything on that yet. We're trying to get the public health guidance out first. Um, but these issues, particularly, as I mentioned, uh, relative to attendance and continuity learning will come into play in exactly those kinds of scenarios. Uh, so we have to prepare for all those things. And I think it's precisely that um, sort of moving among the dispositions that's probably going to be the most challenging piece of this planning. Uh, school districts would prefer to operate one way or the other, but mm -hmm. how we navigate those changes is going to be the most complex thing. So. Um, what I anticipate doing next in terms of our planning process, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, there's going to be a separate task force on students with special needs. We have some work going on at pre-K. Those things are all, I would think, fairly predictable and, and uh, basically embellishment of this cornerstone guidance that we'll produce this week. Um, but I think the area um, that your question sort of alludes to, Senator, it gets right to this issue of decision making about you know, we're, we're talking about in our health guidance, uh, basically three steps or levels. Step one is when all schools are closed and they're doing remote learning. Step two is when we're doing in-person instruction with fairly restrictive health precautions. And step three is when we're doing uh, in-person instruction with limited health precautions, meaning, you know, we have very good suppression rate of the virus and so forth. So that's mm -hmm. that language, which is in the health guidance has to be translated into instructional guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think how we start to do that is getting clear about the decision making authority over those issues. So who's, whose decision is it going to be to move from step one to step two? What are those criteria that are going to be used to inform that decision? And when will those decisions be made and communicated? So I think that next piece in particular, um, which most of the national guidance sort of sh stays away from because it talks about considerations and it basically leaves local decision makers to figure these things out. We're trying to um, work with all our partners to at least get some clarity about how these decisions will be made and communicated because I think precisely as we start to make transitions and among these dispositions uh, that we're really going to have to have a clear um, approach on the one hand to balance what will be uh, the need for local responsiveness. On the other hand, to maintain the discipline that's been so successful for us as a state to ensure that we have a uniform or consistent approach to uh, the social mitigation strategy of closing schools. So, you know, we're, I think that decision making piece, which will come next, is going to really start to unpack a lot of these other issues. Of course, we'll, we'll run pretty quickly into time. Uh, you know, we have a limited amount of time to do the planning. Um, so that's also an important consideration. I think, you know, I still reflect uh, talking with my peers in New England 
Um, Vermont's bought a certain amount of time, a luxury of time to do this planning because of our disciplined approach. So many of my other peers are right in that crucible of still trying to get out of, you know, um, a certain phase of their, their um, response to the virus. We, we've bought ourselves some time to actually do the planning, but it's not a lot of time and districts uh, are gonna need to turn into the specific application of the planning on or before August 1st. So we're gonna have to move pretty quickly to frame this stuff out. So I'm not talking about a lengthy deliberative process, but mm -hmm. one that can be as inclusive as possible to produce some uh, guidance that'll be useful. And then one, one last question. So the, the governor under executive order closed the schools all at once. Is a very basic question, is it your sense now that the intention will be to open all the schools at once, have all the kids go back, and then judging on how well things work, how the infection rates go, schools would try to stay open at that level? Or have you not even decided that piece yet? Yeah, I think my understanding, uh, the governor, uh, I will say revised or amended or issued a new emergency order yesterday uh, updated it through July 15. And uh, in that, my understanding is he's <coughs> delegated authority to me to basically reopen all the schools on mass. Um, so I think that piece is clear to me. I think the uh, what will be coming in our health guidance is a, a recommendation to put all schools into a disposition of that step two, which is, yes, we're open, but we're going to take the most cautionary disposition possible with the most restrictive health measures possible to because just the fact of turning schools on it's not just kids in a school it's all the other social um uh behaviors and inter interactions that turning on schools promotes in communities so i think that's step one is to open schools in the most restrictive disposition possible in terms of public health precautions to then see if there's a response in the virus and then to go to step three which is the you know the idea that we have the least protective precautions inside a school, kids moving around inside the school building a lot more. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, to your observation, though, it, I would say, uh, yes, the, the goal here is maintenance of operations for in-person instruction. That's really the target. So uh, this, this emerges as a theme in the CDC guidance. It's not so much opening schools. It's about how to maintain them in in-person instruction. So we have to not only ramp up to do it, but also ramp up to maintain it. Uh, which is like a continuous operations. And that, in, that perspective informs a lot of what you'll see in the guidance coming out this week. It's like, how do we maintain that operation in full anticipation that some schools might be closed, reopen, uh, students are gonna get sick, staff will get sick. Um, how, do we, how do we manage ourselves through that process? You know? mm -hmm. Okay, very good, thank you. Committee members, uh, questions for the secretary? Senator Ingram. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so do you consider the agency's um, role then um, issuing the, the guidance and uh, it sounds like perhaps the, the principals or superintendents can make um, decisions on the ground as they as conditions warrant? Is that is that sort of the way you're looking at it? We're going to have to figure that out. I guess basically, Senator, um, we have uh, what we what the CDC would term reactive school closure, meaning uh, individual schools closing or staying open relative to conditions. Um, we did some of that at the beginning part of the response. Uh, if you remember back in March before we had um, community spread, essentially, where uh, we were in a containment mode, um, you know, as, as cases, potential cases emerge, schools would shut down, disinfect, possibly reopen and so forth. Um, you know, we've gone through this broader social mitigation phase. Now we're back to containment. Of course, the difference now is we have, I would say, the surveillance. We have the testing and the, the contact tracing available to give us some confidence in doing the containment now. Um, but to what extent, you know, how those decisions get made, we know certainly there'll be consultation with Department of Health and so forth. Um, we have also, um, I think, clarified the role of local health officers who report essentially to the Department of Health. So I think we, what we need to do from a, I would say from a, my experience working in Vermont communities is we just need to bring everyone along with us in terms of how we do this. Uh, because I think, yes, on the one hand, there's gonna be a need to be a response to local conditions. And what I mean by that is that 
a school could be shut down for um, sickness of staff as just as quick as uh, illness in the community. I mean, there, there just could be few, not enough people to run a school or a lack of bus drivers or what have you. There's so many uh, vulnerable points in terms of the logistics of running a school that could could shut down a school for any any situation. So we need to prepare for those while at the same time maintaining our ability to do remote learning. So, you know, keep that momentum going and also understand, um, you know, when will those conditions be safe to reopen? So I think those things we want to explore a little bit more clearly uh, this time around. I think they were, um, you know, haphazard at best at the beginning part of this amount response. All we had really was old CDC guidance from H1N1 on how to do reactive school closure isn't necessarily applicable to the situation. Um, and, you know, it's, I think from my perspective, I think a lot about um, this discipline we've maintained as a state that's so important for us to get, you know, to be able to return to normalcy. So I don't want to lose that. So I think there is a balance we're going to have to negotiate once again between uh, the ability to be responsive, because I think those things are going to emerge. And I'm not, I'm not convinced those decisions can be made well at the state level um, in a timely way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we need to ensure that there's a consistent approach to our intervention against the virus so that uh, we don't have hot spots suddenly emerging around the state. Okay, yeah. other questions for Secretary French? Senator Hardy. Thank you. Um, and thanks for that update, um, Secretary French. Um, I, I, you may know that this uh, morning we, or this whatever midday, we went through our budget proposal, our first quarter budget, and it includes, you know, a significant chunk of the CRF money for um, K-12. And it, a lot of it is $41 million of it is not really defined. It sort of puts it into your hands. And I'm just curious, um, I guess for my my own comfort, I'd, I'd rather see it a little bit more defined. And that's something I will talk to the committee about today. But um, what are your plans for that money? And how might we define it a little bit more to make sure that it's going to uh, allowable uses and preparation for the fall? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's it's it's a uh, it's a complex issue to navigate because we also have the ESSER funds involved. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it also, once again, becomes fairly simple when we consider the priorities. I think um, I can go through these things in more detail, but I would say from immediate need, we're going to have to get money into the system to feed kids uh, sooner rather than later. Um, that's, that's emerging as a, a very important consideration. So that's very concrete. Um, we've been running our student meal programs basically uninterrupted since the beginning of the response. The programs have, were not designed to be run that way. Uh, there's a lot of wear and tear on, let's say, on the people, on the, on the processes, on the logistics, on the transportation. Um, those programs need to be shut down periodically in the summer to clean, to restart, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> when districts don't feel confident that they're going to have the money to do this, they're they're falling back in a more conservative disposition to doing what they want to do. Um, so I think we've got to we've got to inject some money into that immediately. Um, <clears throat> I think as the health guidance comes out, that will then inform uh, the reopening costs, if you will, for physical plant in particular. So I think issues around conditioning nurses spaces in particular will emerge. Uh, we need to have um, basically an isolation space for school nurses to uh, put students who might have COVID-like symptoms. They can't be in a nursing office uh, at the same time. So to provision those kinds of structures, um, possibly do some other configuration of classrooms, temporary gym, use of gyms, things like that. So those things will emerge from the guidance. In there will also be HVAC. I know you've been discussing HVAC. HVAC is on a list of things along those lines. Um, so I think there's some reopening costs, but then, the, so I would, I'm just trying to rank these by priority a little bit, feeding kids immediate need, um, conditioning facilities. And then we have a strategy, I think, around trying to address the uh, deficit in the ad fund. Uh, we have the ability with CRF due to its uh, flexible, well, say less flexibility, but narrow focus, but also its shorter time frame that sort of begs the question, what can we do with it now? Uh, because ESSER can be used for a longer period of time. And um, the uh, one strategy we identified, which is, I think, Brad James qualified about $16 million, is the ability 
uh, to reimburse districts for the mandatory staffing costs they've utilized in fiscal year 20 as much as fiscal year 21. So as you know, we've required districts to maintain payroll. Um, we think those costs could be qualified for CRF in fiscal year 20. Uh, we don't, you know, we just did an extrapolation of our model. It works out to about $16 million. If that's true, that would uh, allow districts to generate surplus in 21, which could mean we could, uh, I would say, claw back a net payment around that same amount, which could help, mm -hmm. uh, you know, take some pressure off the deficit. So I think, mm -hmm. You know, my priority would be to feed the kids, provision the spaces, and then see if we could do something on uh, the Ed Fund issue. Okay, go ahead, Ruth. Just follow up on that. Um, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, in terms of the feeding the kids, uh, that is something that the Senate Education or Senate Agriculture Committee has discussed, and I've um, also brought it up here in the Senate Education Committee. I believe that there, we're hoping to have a package of uh, sort of food security and at least address it for summer meals and potentially into the fall. Um, so was that something you were planning on using that 50 million for or is is that a separate thing? So that's one of my questions. And then the second thing is one thing I didn't hear you mention and this is sort of uh, something that um, was brought up earlier was um, professional development for teachers both in how to teach and work in this new world of COVID education, but and and also professional development around delivering remote learning. I know they took a sort of crash course in how to do it this yeah. time, but, um, yeah. and they did a fabulous job. I mean, no no uh, yeah. complaints. But you know, obviously, we can always do better. And I think if there are plans and and training ahead of time for how to deliver remote learning, it will be a lot more substantive and robust in, in the fall and the year. And we know that we'll probably have periods where there's gonna have to be remote learning, at least on some level. So yeah. I'm wondering if you could address that. And then I can't remember the last one. So just those two things, I guess. Start. Yeah, so your first question, yes, I would use CRF funds to feed students and that would include uh, transportation costs. You know, we've, we've had to, uh, into the larger issue of food security, uh, the school infrastructure has been used in a broader social way to, to address this issue. Um, and it's important from a logistics standpoint. And we basically have, I want to say, boots on the ground from a military perspective, but we have the infrastructure to do this. It's a critical piece of the infrastructure. Uh, that infrastructure is in a state of shutting down right now if we don't inject some cash into it. Um, so absolutely. And I think that's also aligns well with the CRF use. Um, in terms of professional development, I wouldn't necessarily target CRF for that because I think districts, firstly, uh, ESSER funds would be at a very appropriate use of that. They also have the cash on hand this summer anyway through uh, their title grants, and there's usually pretty significant carryover in those grants on an annual basis. This would be their Title I and so forth, IDEA B funds. So they have, I think, for, in terms of the summer, uh, significant resources available to stage professional development and training. I don't see that as something that's necessarily a cash flow issue right now. Um, but I think also relative to how CRF is qualified, CRF really, you have to make a connection, you know, between COVID uh, sort of, you've been impacted negatively by COVID and therefore you're using these funds in this way. So I think when I, when I think about CRF versus ESSER, I think of CRF in terms of reimbursement for expenses, like, okay, we've, we've got to feed kids, we've got to build some things those are costs above and beyond. I think it becomes a little squishier on professional development. And I think ESSER on the other hand is clearly open for professional development and um, you know, any, basically any federal education program. So those funds are gonna hang around a little longer for them and they provide greater flexibility. And so in my own mind, I've been separating out sort of CRF for reimbursement kind of expenses with operations and ESSER for the education professional development piece. So Secretary French, I just wanted to ask, um, it's our understanding that districts were told, they were given a line that they could um, charge expenses on uh, and guidelines about what would qualify and what wouldn't. Um, and I imagine this chunk of funding that we're talking about operating in the same way. Um, how has that worked, the, the process whereby the districts themselves are figuring out on the fly how to charge that. 
are you seeing that by and large people are within the guidelines and there's not a lot of worry about um, people exceeding the guidelines? Yeah, I think it's it's too early to tell actually because we haven't reimbursed them for anything. You know, we we started out pretty early in the process, say, hey, code everything, you know, just yeah. code everything. We don't know, you know, because we're still talking with FEMA and things like that. We don't know. Code everything and then we'll go from there. So um, we haven't, you know, unfortunately, we haven't put any money out into the system yet. We have, the, you know, the promise of money, but then, you know, as, as we got a clearer sense of how CARES Act, including ESSER, GEAR, and CRF could be utilized, um, we also started to understand our revenue shortfall, the Ed Fund, and so forth. So, um, you know, the legislature asked me uh, to withhold the application for ESSER, for example, until the broader implications of Ed Funding could be understood. Um, so districts, we've been telling them to code. They've been coding. Um, we, we're telling them they're entitled to ESSER, but we're also telling them there might be a clawback coming. Um, we're telling them there's CRF uh, coming out the door for immediate things, but no money no money has come. So I think districts are, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, because the beauty of our, of course, our system is all state money anyway. So, um, but they, they've been on the hook and in, in delivering services. And, and I think certainly coming into the end of this fiscal year, which ends in two weeks, uh, some districts won't necessarily be in a bad position financially because they've also been able to shut down transportation and so forth. So mm -hmm. every time we polled sort of the business managers on where are you at, it's always been like, well, we're, we're doing all right. You know, some, some districts have seen big, significant, I would say, deficit in a, like a food program, but they've been able to, you know, gain that back in some other area of their operation. So I'm not, I'm not expecting districts necessarily to end the fiscal year in a, in a different place, but it's just all the uncertainty um, that I see manifest, particularly in the issue of summer programming. When we started to produce guidance for folks that said, hey, you can offer summer programming, you, you can feed schools this summer or kids this summer. A lot of people just didn't want to go into that with a, a sense of confidence because they were uncertain of their financial picture. You know, they just, mm -hmm. they know these things are looming on the horizon and, uh, they're not certainly not sure uh, what next fiscal year will look like at all. So there's, uh, I think there's a need now to put some of this money in play for people so we can just start attacking uh, some of the, the issues that are just, I mean, from a real practical mm -hmm. standpoint, from our perspective, um, you know, we're going to need to open schools and we'll worry about how to pay for it later on. And we, we need to put some money in the, in the system now to get that work started. Um, but obviously, the, the, there's going to be long-term fiscal implications for the COVID response, and that's not going to be resolved in this fiscal year or next one. It'll probably be several years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions for the Secretary? Well, thank you so much, Secretary French. I appreciate you keeping us up to date. And, uh, you know, as you develop more detail, we're only going to be here for another hopefully week and a half, and then we'll be okay. going on break. Um, but you can always reach us by email, even on the break. Um, and then when we come back, maybe we'll check in with you first thing. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, have a good afternoon. Okay. Okay, committee, um, if you look on the agenda, you'll see we have three, three main things that we set out to do today. I'm not sure how much discussion we'll do on each one, but I wanted to open discussion on all of them. And the first one goes back to the HVAC discussion we had um, last time. So the very last thing we did was to give Becky Wasserman um, a little bit of direction on the HVAC program and and the definition of the schools that were uh, eligible. So um, my memory of it was that we had said approved independence would be eligible along with public schools. Um, and so the, the draft reflects that, but I know I had email from Ruth saying that that wasn't her sense of the conversation. So I just wanted to make sure that we didn't leave that. The draft right now says, if students are tuition publicly into your district, you qualify for the HVAC work. Um, so Ruth, do you wanna pick up there? Yeah, thanks. I just, my impression from our conversation 
last week was that what we were talking about were the four um, academies or whatever they're called um, in Thetford, St. J, St. Albans, and man, I can't remember where the fourth one is. So that we were just thinking about those four high schools as potentially um, eligible, but not all of the many little tiny private schools that may have tuition students. That was what I took from our conversation. And so I was just concerned that given the state of our public school buildings and the huge need that we know that, that we have for facilities that we're opening it up too broadly to other types of, of, uh, of institutions. And I, I, uh, I can see where confusion might come in because we do sometimes um, talk about the traditional academies and public schools and then independent schools over here. In this case, my, I looked at it the, the way we looked at the lead bill, which was public health issue. We're trying as quickly as possible before December to reach as many Vermont schools um, as possible because in a public health pandemic, we're, we're all in it together in a, in a biological way. Um, so uh, I, I was able to check in with some other people who seemed to have assumed in that conversation we were talking about the broader category of approved independence. Um, but so I guess what I'm saying is I would personally, I would prefer that it reach those approved independence to which we publicly tuition kids because in their communities, they're liable to spread virus just like anybody else. Um, but this would uh, leave out independents who are not approved for public dollars. Um, so thoughts on that from anybody? Yeah, Andy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I had the same impression as, as you, Senator Bruce, that it was not the same as the lead, because that included everybody and all the daycares, but that it was all the approved independent schools that have public dollar students flowing to them is, is how I thought of it in, in my mind. And, and that's the, the other uh, thing I'll say, the way I'd like to see it stay. if you look at the language that's right now in the Q1 budget that came over from the House, they've they've conditioned the 1.5, first of all, they've set a cap of 1.5 million for expenses for approved independence, um, which is proportionate to their number of students. Um, and they've set an individual cap of 400 something dollars per student. Um, that strikes me as way more work than necessary, but I told Representative Webb, I was okay with going along with that on that money if she and her committee would go along with having the HVAC program be broadly available to approved independents. In other words, um, the House committee has generally not wanted to spend money on approved independents. And the Senate committee traditionally has argued that um, if public money flows there, we should treat them more or less uh, equitably. So. The way it's set up now, the HVAC program is not conditioned, the other money is, and that's a kind of balancing act that I think um, she and I felt like we could live with. So um, Ruth, it sounds like what the House has done on that other money would be more in line with what you're thinking. What, what, what other money? You mean the 1.5 million? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I did notice that in the budget last night when I was going through the budget, and um, that is for approved independence, correct? The one point yeah. five million, and yes. it's for yeah. Um, I, do you know how many um, approved independent schools there are, Phil? Oh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Jim, no, he's on the. But thing. the you know uh, the number of students yeah. is quite small. It's yeah, a couple of <laughs> thousand. I don't, I don't know the answer uh, to Harley, but I, I that figure came from Brad James, who had divided the number of students by the number of schools. 
-hmm. So um, he has all that information readily at hand. Okay, I mean, in the in the uh, in the whatever the word is, the I, I'm. I mean, as you know, when this has come up before, I've have just some discomfort with um, everybody's moving um, with um, with uh, spending, uh, you know, including them in all of the programs that we create. However, in the this effort to move this along, I'm I'm happy to go with whatever the committee. I, I also just want to note that when we talk about higher education, I just I, I hope that you'll remember this conversation because I would like to make a similar argument for higher education. So uh, just note this, that I am happy to go along with the, with the, the majority of the committee on, on this and, and make it allowable for approved independence, um, assuming that most of it will go to our public schools who are in desperate need of, of this type of work. Okay, so um, unless anybody else registers an objection, the draft of the Q1 budget now reflects um, the draft, the last draft that Becky produced for us, which is approved independence and public schools, which I think Ruth was saying she could go along with reluctantly, but could go along with it. Andy. I just want to say that I did receive a couple edits from the Department of Public Service or suggested edits when they looked at it and they, they had one and I sent those to Becky. I sent them to the committee. I don't know if people looked at it, but uh, I took a one, quick look. They thought it was important to, to reference the statute that regulates efficiency Vermont. So that's in there. And then just a couple other uh, adding to the report that efficiency Vermont does to include the efficiency work that they do just so it's clear. So there, uh, Jeannie did quick work and put it up on the website and I did email it out. If, I, I saw it and it looked, you know, there's sort of technical um, clarifications. So I think that's fine. The bigger question is how best to get them into what's now on the calendar. Um, Becky did send it over to Stephanie and appropriate. Oh, okay. And, just, and, Becky, yeah. can you join us for a second? Hey. Yeah, um, uh, yeah so I w I've been coordinating with um, JFO. So they have, they have the edited version of the amendment now. Um, so I can, uh, I guess I can just follow up with them on what the next steps are, but I think that they had a, a couple of technical amendments. So I don't know if they're just going to add it into what another amendment that they are already working on for the Q1 bill, or if you would like to do this separately. Oh, it, it could be part of their amendment. No, no okay. problem. Aren't we already doing an amendment, Phil, the one that you sent out yesterday? Could we add it to that? Well, we could. Um, I suppose that's a different topic, but if it's if it's easier to have them amend the HVAC language, let's do that. Okay. Um, and th that way our amendment will be limited to the higher ed piece, um, especially since Stephanie already has it. Is that right, Becky? Yeah, she already has it. So let me um, just contact her right now just to confirm that it can um, go that route um, where they just add it into the amendment that they're already working on. And I know that they, they have it and I think that they looked at it, the committee looked at it. Um, so um, I can just email you all back and let you know if um, there's a problem with that approach. Okay, okay. sounds good. Uh, okay, so one down. So um, now select committee on higher education. So um, I sent everybody both the house's language, which is a select committee on higher education writ, writ large in the state. And then I sent a rewrite and just a quick history on, on that rewrite. So, um, you remember when the state colleges uh, issue sort of spilled out, there was a general commitment from the appropriations chair and the pro tem to, and the speaker to come up with bridge funding. And then there was a consultant hired whose report just came out. And the report basically said that 
if anything, Jeb uh, Spaulding's estimate was perhaps a little too low for the bridge funding, that it might in fact be higher. So rather than 25, he thought, that is the consultant thought that 30 million made sense as a set aside for bridge funding for one year. Um, so JFO had been taking the lead on the, what was happening with the state colleges, but I was checking in with them. Then the House Committee came forward with the language that they um, sent over, I believe in the yield bill. Isn't that right, Jim? I think so. Or was it in their Q1 budget? You're, you're muted, Jim. It was H961. Oh, okay. The, the yield bill. So um, when uh, Senator Kitchell, Senator Ash, and I looked at that draft, we all had kind of the same reaction, which was we thought it was very, very large and that the charge that it laid out was also extremely broad. And the timeline, if you remember from what the speaker and the pro tem have said, is that they want to begin giving answers to the VSC system, its faculty, its students, the communities involved by December. Not to say that the entire thing will be gamed out by December, but that we should begin projecting a certain direction by Christmas. So as I looked at the house's um, language, it seemed to me more the sort of thing that I would expect of a multiple year effort. So in other words, if you're gonna address all of higher ed, you have independent colleges, you have big colleges like Middlebury, UVM, St. Mike's, um, and you have then the state college system. They also, uh, for good reason, I think, have the business community represented, uh, labor uh, from the administration, BSAC. So it was a it was a very far ranging thing. And so I worked on a draft that reduced the number of members and reduced the scope of the charge to center it around Vermont State Colleges, but with reference to other pieces of the Vermont system as they dovetail with the Vermont State College immediate problem. So in other words, the business community is still there as is UVM, but they're there pretty much to discuss how we might think about um, restructuring our system of state colleges to more take advantage of those opportunities, those partnerships, those collaborations. Um, so I'll finish by saying this was not an attempt to say we should never take a, a, a completely broad brush look at higher ed, but that given the time constraints of the VSC system, which if you think about it from the point of view of somebody who might be going, thinking about going to NVU, the last thing they heard was that NVU might be closed down. Uh, and so until there's an announcement of some kind about what will happen, there is uncertainty about what might happen. And that is gonna be a continuing drag on enrollment, which is a, a, a tiger eating its own tail. So um, with that, I'll, I'll open it up uh, to, comments about the draft, questions about the draft. The, the only final thing I'll say is that the timing on this is that I've agreed with Senator Kitchell that we'll have an amendment to offer on Thursday. Um, and it will replace whatever we do, we'll uh, go into the reserved section of our bill um, and, and we'll replace the house language um, that was going to go there. So with that said, uh, Senator Ingram. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, like uh, the Senate version, uh, the version you, you worked on, uh, Senator Brees. Um, I think we do need to focus on um, you know, the immediate 
problem. And um, I was a little concerned, um, thinking that you you know the relationship between UVM and VSC should be uh, explored a little bit. But you do ha actually have language when I read it more carefully, uh, which yeah. you know asks for that to be taken into consideration. So I think that's important. And I also think uh, one thing, another thing I really like about this version is that the Secretary of Education is not include, uh, included. I mean, the Secretary of Education has got way too much on, <laughs> on his plate right now, I think anyway, I don't think he needs to be involved in, um, in this as well. So um, yeah, so I, 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 prefer, I prefer this version. Okay. Other comments, questions? Senator Perchel. There was a, a reference in here to a consultant of the steering, right. I think. Can you just explain? Sure. Um, so the other thing I would say is that I'm, I'm very aware of the timing and the need to agree with the House. And so if you look at the two versions together, I've, I've borrowed very, very extensively from their draft. So whatever I felt like we could keep is is verbatim from their draft. Uh, and so the consultant piece is their language. Um, what it says is that the steering group of this select committee will work with a consultant to develop these plans that we're talking about on the timeline that we're talking about. The funding for that would come out of the bridge funding to the state colleges. So in what Jane described today, if you remember the the little grid, there was bridge funding to the state colleges and this money for this consultant would come out of that money. So it wouldn't be an additional expense over the bridge funding, it would be part of it. And the consultant we would um, be selecting in conjunction with NEBI, the New England Board of Higher Education. They helped the house develop their language um, another reason why I wanted to preserve as much of their structure, governance, uh, et cetera, as possible. But the consultant, I think, is a really big deal because you need somebody with expertise who can present this group with workable, actionable ideas relatively quickly. They would be working for the steering committee, the consultant, basically. For, for the whole committee, but the steering oh. committee would be the the liaison to that consultant. Okay, thanks. Senator Hardy. Thank you. Um, I have to say when I read the, the House's version, I had this like weird flashback to that bill that we worked on for the Special Education Advisory Council. <laughs> <laughs> you guys remember that where there were like yeah, a yeah. million members and they were, I was like, ah, this again. So um, the version that you came up with is, is much more streamlined. So I appreciate that. Um, just a question. I'm just skimming through it. Is there an, anything in here about um, student accessibility and affordability of the state colleges, um, knowing that their tuition is really high and wanting to make sure that whatever we come up with moving forward is more affordable for students? I'm I thought I saw it, but now I can't find it. Yeah, let me, uh, it says uh, to meet state goals and learners needs, um, promote student success. Yeah, that's, that's not as specific as what you're asking for. Um, we could certainly add that. So you're, you're talking about um, affordability. For students. Yeah, essentially, you know, we've talked about this a lot in the context of our bills on mm -hmm. student scholarships, et cetera, and just wanting to make sure that that doesn't get lost in the shuffle of how to save the state colleges that if we save them, we, we need them to be affordable for students to go there. Yeah. So, I don't know, Jim, if there's a place you think you can add something like that, but just underscoring student is, is affordability there, and access. Is there, is, is there a twice, twice already? Oh, oh it's where is it, Jim? So it's on uh, subsection E, the leading language uh, to the one, two, and three uh, shall offer recommendations to how to increase affordability, access, retention, attainment, et cetera. Oh, I see. 
here. And then at the very beginning of the bill, uh, subsection A is there okay. too. So it's um, on line four or five, it says quality, affordable, affordable sustainable feature. So you've got it twice. Okay. Um, well, I guess the, the lead in, it's not clear who is it affordable to. Is it affordable for students or affordable for taxpayers or, or whom? So I guess making sure that we're we're talking about student access and affordability is my mm -hmm. my concern. So, um, and I I the the other issue is as I appreciate the the need and and desire to focus on the state colleges and to do so quickly because you're right there's so many people who are wanting to know what's going on. I do also think that after we stabilize the state colleges, a larger discussion about higher education in Vermont is really important to have. And I'm wondering if we could include language about recommendations about, I don't know, the next step after this or something that would sort of cue up that conversation to happen. I, I guess I hesitate to ask this group to do that because I, I feel like having been a part of these committees, what you do is you apportion your meetings depending on your charge. And so I, I wouldn't wanna take away their meetings on this, but I, I could see a, a separate bill that goes through in January that puts in place a follow on to this. Um, you know, we're only, by the time we adjourn, there's only gonna be about four or five months until January. Um, so I suppose that's when I would think about doing it is actually creating what you're talking about at that point. Um, okay, that that's, makes, yeah, that's sense? fair, that's fair. I just wanna make sure we don't lose that momentum of caring about yeah. education. <laughs> no, and, and I, I fully agree. That's a discussion that has to happen, um, but, once we've got this set of solutions in hand. Um, Andy, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, Senator Hardy's point about affordability reminded me, because somebody asked me about our, what we're called the free tuition bill, even though it wasn't free tuition, but, and, and if there was an opportunity here, it, if this consultant was gonna look at these things, because their feeling was that there's some, some some programmatic or in financial efficiencies of, of doing the free tuition and I'm wondering other than just saying how to increase affordability do you think it would be getting too far afield like your response to the last point if if we had something in there about you know free tuition or reduced tuition or just to like in, along senator hardy's point saying more than just how to increase affordability in here I agree. Um, so there's already a place where it asks to the committee to look at other um, states' systems. Jim, um, maybe right there we could look at other states' um, tuition reduction or free college programs. That would be great. Uh, okay. Other thoughts? Like New York's, for example. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, are, are people okay with those changes? Yeah, is Jim gonna get a, are you gonna get a draft with those changes about affordability and other others? Yeah, I'll get that. And then this is going in the form of an amendment, I believe, who's offering the amendment? Uh, we can all offer it, all the members of the committee. Yep. And it would go out on Thursday morning, so third reading, and to the Q1 budget. Okay. And when you have those changes made, if you want to just email email it out to the committee, Jim. Sure. Yeah. We'll do. Okay. Ruth. Yeah. So I don't know if this is the right time to to bring this up, but this is related to higher ed and yeah, uh, and my my thing earlier where I said, remember that I supported the <laughs> independent schools, which is, um, and this is in our uh, transitions work group report, um, which is um, to provide some funding to the independent colleges, 
specifically for testing and PPE. Mm -hmm. um, the colleges uh, have 23,000 students and they're coming back. Um, 18,500 of them are from out of state. And mm -hmm. they're, the state has said that they don't think they'll have enough testing capacity to test all of those students when they come back to our state. And so the independent colleges are going to be required to come up with their own testing uh, resources mm -hmm. and PPE. Um, so this is a huge issue in my town, of course, where a quarter of the residents in Middlebury are students from out of town. Um, and so there's a lot of anxiety here, but I'm assuming, and it's true in Craftsbury and Bennington and Montpelier maybe, the, all, it, the, play, uh, all the places that have independent colleges that are especially the small towns where they make up a significant portion. Um, so I was wanting to request that we put funding into this budget that would help support that, uh, the testing um, and that we somehow just either, I don't know, appropriate to the Agency of Education or if we can give it directly to AVIC to have them distribute in some way. But um, in talking to Susan Stightly this morning, mm -hmm. the, the just to provide one test to each of the, the um, out of state students coming in, it's about $3 million. And then the PPE estimate is about 750,000. Um, so, so 4 million all told? About 4 million all, all told um, for testing and PPE. And um, I just wanted to put that out there and request the committee um, if we could just advocate for that to along the same lines of, you know, it, we're all in this together. These people are going to be living in our communities and we want to make sure that we're as safe as possible when they return. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a hundred percent behind that. Um, I live in Burlington. We're going to have 10,000 uh, out of state students come back. It's a huge issue in terms of how is the, just to give you one quick example, the Weinberger administration, um, I think, thought they were doing a good thing. So they put out to the community saying, we've developed a program. So when the students come back, we'll have um, city police monitoring adherence to social distancing guidelines by driving through neighborhoods to make sure there aren't big parties. Now put that in the context of the George Floyd protests. And there were immediate, um, you know, really, really strenuous objections to this to being police, to you know, having those people in their neighborhoods. So, you know, there's a whole lot that's going to go on there. But again, to go back to the public health idea, we should not be skimping on testing, contact tracing, PPE. So, um, Ruth, I agree with you. I think I saw everybody nodding when you were talking. Why don't I talk to Jane directly? Ask her, tell her that the committee. Uh, am I am I reading the committee right? Do, does everybody support that idea? Yes, it was it was brought up to, with me too with Norwich University in Northfield. Here in okay, so yeah. let me talk to Jane, see what she thinks is the most efficient route, and sound her out on the amounts. Um, but I will use a round figure of four million, and you would be thinking, Ruth, of. Is it just members of AVIC or any independent college? Because there are, I think there's still at least one or two that aren't members. I think there was, Green Mountain College was not a member, but then they closed. So right. I, I think they're all members at this point. There may the, be one. It's the, not. the cartoon. Uh, right, the cartoon college. And they have right. very few students. I think they have yeah. maybe a maybe hundred or 200. Um, I don't think we could appropriate it to AVIC. Um, yeah, I don't know how that worked, but I, I can yeah. forward you the email, Phil, that I got from Susan this morning um, that has the numbers in it. Um, okay. And I'll I, pass and she, that on to Jen. And, and she gave me the list of all the colleges that are members of AVIC, too. Um, but I don't okay. know who is not on that list. All right. So, so, sorry. I was going to say, I hope that we can have some new stightly language to refer to. <laughs> Yes. Maybe, maybe if this goes through, she'll forgive us for the <laughs> modified slightly. Um, okay, so I will I will look into that. Um, I I will say I don't know if you um, saw Senator Kitchell on our Zoom call. 
holding her head. Um, she really was experiencing a horrible migraine, she thinks brought on by all the Zoom. I mean, she's on Zoom from morning to night. Um, so I will do my best to contact her tonight, might be tomorrow, but once I do, I'll try to get word back to the committee about what that looks like and what route it might take. Um, okay, so any anything else on that? All right, let's go to our last element, which is the transitions team and the letter that came out from, uh, among others, Ruth, Jim, and Debbie. And we have about a half an hour left. So however you guys would like to um, verbally annotate your letter or, or run down the process you took or what you think are the most important things for us to look at. The, the only thing I'll say is we have about a week and a half until we go on break. So um, taking up big things at this point will be immediately interrupted. So anything large would necessarily need to wait till August. And then anything really large would probably then wait till January. But are there things we could be doing immediately, things we could do in August and the, that three-tiered system? So start whoever, however, whenever. <laughs> Go ahead, Ruth. Okay, well, I can start because I was, it was Anthony, uh, Senator Polina and I did the, the education section and I sent it along to all of you um, just for your information along with the full letter. Um, and I, I had a quick conversation with Senator Westman just before our meeting to see what else is being, what is being taken care of where. And it sounds to me, you know, our transition committee was specifically on the transition back from COVID or the transition in and out of COVID. So the longer term issues were done by the other subcommittee. Um, so it sounds to me like the health and welfare committee is addressing a lot of the childcare issues. Um, and so we wouldn't necessarily need to. I think the one area where we might want to see if there's anything that, that needs addressing is in pre-K, um, but they are sort of under the umbrella of K-12 schools, you know, or private childcare and, you know, so I don't know that there's anything specific there. I think a longer term look at how many hours we, we fund for pre-K, but that's for next session and beyond, not for yeah. now. Um, the K-12 schools, um, some of those issues were addressed this more or this earlier by um, Secretary French and are addressed in the budget bill. Um, the the language in the the um, in our transitions work group, uh, we talked about facilities work, which we have at least in part addressed with Andy's package. Um, food service, which I just I don't know, Phil, if, you're, if your understanding is that that part of that 50 million would be for food service, that was a question I wanted to get from the secretary, or if this other food security package may address those issues. I heard you asked him that, and then I interpreted his answer as he intends to fund that directly with this 50 million. Yeah, that's what I thought too from his yeah. response. So that that may be addressed already. Um, just making sure that we have summer food and and making sure our food service programs are are um, appropriate for the fall or ready for the fall. Um, one thing he did allude to, but I don't know that he got into much detail, was the mental health and trauma services that may be necessary for schools in the fall. I just want to make sure that we. Um, that there's a, enough of an emphasis for, I know that a lot of students are gonna need extra services um, and making sure schools are prepared for that. Um, and then uh, the compensatory education for both um, special education and regular education students, frankly, um, who were didn't get as much education as they had in because of remote learning. Um, and um, then the, the, the thing I asked the secretary about with the professional development and making mm -hmm. sure that teachers 
are trained not only for working it with COVID, but also um, the, the potential for more remote learning and making sure it's more robust. I know that's the same conversation you're having at higher education level too. Mm -hmm. um, so those were the things in the K-12 area that I'm just looking close, uh, quickly at what we, and, and then of course, uh, the hole in the education fund and how do we yeah. address that more broadly? I, I thought that was uh, good news when he said they've identified 16 million that in essence could be um, plugged in with COVID funding um, through moving some stuff around. Uh, that, that helps. He, he was talking about realizing it through a clawback. Um, so I assume that's going to be the administration's main proposal is when we come back as a clawback of a varying size, depending what the budget hole looks like at that point. Mm -hmm. So I guess in the K-12 areas, just whether or not the committee feels like we should better define the use of that 50 million. And I'm, you know, I always like to have things defined. I like plans, but I also understand the need for flexibility. So that that's a conversation perhaps. And then in higher education, um, I think that most of the things that were uh, in the transitions committee report, um, we did recommend another $5 million for student um, grant aid, and that was in the budget. And I, clear, I confirmed that with Senator Westman. Um, th another thing was making sure that there was sufficient tr uh, transition money for both for, for VSC and then funding for UVM. One thing that is was in our report was uh, um, and uh, make the with the UVM funding. Given the testimony that we've heard about some of the decisions they've made, um, mm. maybe having some language. I, I guess based on my question earlier today during our caucus, I'm concerned about UVM getting additional funding for a new program when they're doing things like cutting salaries and, and closing their childcare center. So something about equity and um, in their, and transparency in their yeah. funding. Um, and then the final thing is the PPE and testing for the, the independent colleges, which hopefully we can um, address. And then the last paragraph was on arts organizations. And I talked to Senator Westman and he suggested I reach out to the economic development committee about that. Mm -hmm. um, because that's not necessarily in our bailiwick, but. Um. Um, well, I, I want to go to Debbie in just a second and see if she can give us clarity on which pieces health and welfare is going to do. Um, to the UVM language, I have had a couple of conversations with Senator Kitchell about that. She's of the opinion that we can't condition the COVID money uh, in the ways that the UVM faculty have been asking for. That's not to say that we need to fund that new program, um, because I hear you on that. If you remember, President Garamella pitched that to us prior to the COVID epidemic. That was a $2 million expenditure. Um, I do think that if we can do it for one year with COVID funding, and use it as a way to, um, you know, stabilize the business community with UVM's resources. That seems to me a way to get the federal government to pay for something that no doubt they were going to get anyway. Um, UVM is successful in appropriations almost to 100% of what they ask for usually. So I like the fact that it was using the one-time federal money and that Jane said, after that, it had to sink or swim on its own. But what, in, in other words, she said conditioning the COVID money was not uh, legally allowable in her opinion. But I said, what about the next budget that we write? Because we'll have an appropriation for UVM and that, that won't be COVID money. Um, and so she said she would be willing to talk about it at that point. So that's kind of where I have my my iron in the fire with her on that. You mean um, the budget we do in August? That, that, yes. that Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Debbie, so are we right in assuming that 
we've been talking about a, a big chunk of money that would go to child care. Uh, is, is that coming from your committee to your other committee? It is, yeah. Yes. What does it look like? Or well, do you know? We weren't, yeah, we weren't able to get um, uh, Nolan Langwell. We couldn't find him this morning. <laughs> so tomorrow we're going to go over. Um, uh, Senator Lyons works on a, a $215 million spending package for healthcare um, related items. And, and she said that uh, child care is part of that. Um, I, I don't really have any specifics, though. So, um, Okay. They were. I know they were asking in the realm of like eighteen to twenty million dollars. I don't know if she put in all that or not. How, how about I have been contacted by uh, you, Ruth. You might know Dan Dewalt. Uh, I think he's down your yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, um, he contacted me about. He's a trauma counselor, and he contacted me about the need for increased trauma counseling and mental health services as kids go back. Is that something health and welfare is looking at? Yes, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay good. In the schools, Debbie? Trauma? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's part of it. Okay. Okay. So, um, Ruth, out of the stuff you mentioned, the biggest action piece is the independent college piece money. That has to be done in the next day or two. Um, and then as far as whether we would try to make more specific the spending that is going to come out of the 50 million, um, I know from Kate that the house was going to work on some general language around what was allowable, but I have a feeling it won't be any more specific than the guidance AOE has already put out. Um, so I, I guess if I think about it, if we wrote something, you know, we had the secretary list five or six areas of spending, we would wind up having to say something like, these are allowed, you know, including but not limited to these things, which doesn't really change the state of affairs in terms of what it could be spent on, because the, the word including would still allow the flexibility for categories we haven't anticipated. Um, so I suppose that's an area where I think the, the secretary and AOE have had discretion and they will have discretion on the coded items that come in. And that's the system we've had working through half the spending. So it seems like, you know, continuing it seems to me like a fine, a fine way to proceed because I can't imagine specific guidelines that wouldn't be overly restrictive. That makes sense. Is your understanding that that 50 or 41 million is all, well set aside, is all for reimbursement? So like schools spend the money and then they submit receipts or a report or whatever to AOE and then they get reimbursed with the CRF money. Is that your understanding of how it's gonna yes. work? Okay, so that they would then get guidance from AOE about what are the allowable things, then yep. do a monthly whatever and get their money back. That's yep. and, and so, as he said, code everything. And so they're, they're coding, as I, as I understand it, they're coding generously, like with the, with the idea that, you know, this, that, or the other thing might ultimately be declared, no, that's going to have to go out of your general budget um but that you know 95 percent of it would be allowable expenses um and i'm not a hundred percent clear on you know the state is in essence going to do the same thing mm -hmm. pass on all of these expenses to the federal government at which point you know there might be some disallowed expenses in the q1 budget if you notice there's now a, a you know a hold harmless provision that says if you acted in good faith you won't be asked to pay that money back so ultimately the state general fund is going to have to pick up a lot of those expenses that are ultimately disallowed hopefully not too many but um okay other 
Other thoughts? Yeah, Andy. It was brought up earlier that the 1 million or the whatever that number is, 1.5 million, is that, is the house still proceeding with that? Uh, you mean for the uh, approved independence? No, for the evaluation of all the school buildings. Remember they had a oh, million. Oh, oh, um, you know, we, we took testimony on the school construction bill. It's in ways and means and hasn't moved. Okay. Um, I did check in with Representative Webb about that. She says that Janet Ansel likes it, but that was the last I heard. Um, so I assume it's gotten kicked after this, you know, Q1 train. Um, it's hard to believe we're going to do it before we leave. So what I would imagine is that they, um, it doesn't make it over to us before we go home, but then in August it does. I said to Kate that I thought we had had a lot of positive testimony on it and that we had some questions about the amount of money. We had some questions about could more money go to district sooner, um, but that in general we were supportive of it and that we would try to get her a version of it back to her. But that presumes that they get something to us. So um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have. Um, we've sent them a lot of stuff. But when you look at what they've sent us over the last you know, two years, they really haven't put forward a, a lot in the way of legislation. And that's typical with the House committee. Um, I think I said the other day, I've been chairing this committee for four years. I think they've sent over seven bills um, in four years, which is kind of astounding, but their money committees are much more aggressive with them than ours are. So their money committees kill their major bills two thirds of the time, um, you know, just dead on the floor, not going anywhere. Um, and fortunately our, our Appropriations Committee and Finance Committee tend to work with us much more readily. Um, so anyways, that will that will come to us, but it might be when we get back in August. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ruth. Yeah, I just got some updated information. Uh, one, the Cartoon College has 48 students. Uh, Susan just emailed you and me, Phil. Okay. And they are not federally accredited, so they're not allowed to get federal funding, apparently. Okay. Um, and so that answers that question and everybody else is a member of AVIC. Okay, um, um, yeah, go ahead. And, and then on a different topic, I asked the secretary to send any French to send any information he had on the uses of that 40 million or 50 million. And he does, he sent me a little slide proposal, which I can I can forward you all this stuff yeah. but just really quickly. He said that 10 million of it would be for child nutrition for this summer. Um, so that's good to know for the yeah. people who are looking at the nutrition. 16 million for reimbursement of mandatory staffing costs for FY20. And then he has 40 million for facilities reimbursement. Mm -hmm. But this is a week old, what he sent me. So maybe now it's yeah. down a little bit. Um, so that was the breakdown that he had identified when he presented it to the house. Well, it's good to know that 10 million is going to food. Um, Jim, can you join us for a sec? Sure, yep. Um, this is a perennial, you know, thorny debate, but when we talk about the independent colleges, I'm thinking here of St. Mike's, um, are there issues with religious independence and, and sending money to them for the emergency? I think in the case we talked about earlier. Um, that the answer is no. Yeah, the answer is no, I think because it's a program designed to be neutral in terms of, right? It's, it's right. Direct. And it's like resurfacing playgrounds, the great funding had to go to all. Not and it's not, it's not fungible. So it's, it's not like they're going to be able to direct it indirectly to a religious instruction. Uh, if it's for COVID costs, eligible costs, yeah. the fact that this is for religious instruction, I don't think it should matter because yeah. that's the context in which they, they operate. 
which yeah. is usually design program. That said, the reservation I'll have is that that case, the Rice case, is still pending. So we yeah. don't know where the Vermont Supreme Court is going with that. Yeah. Well, I I suppose my my tendency would just be again to include everybody. Um, it is, as Debbie knows very well, it is an issue that we've had with the House before, but but let's try to cast the net as broadly as we can. Um, again, public health emergency um, with everybody in the community being affected by everybody else in the community. So if there was ever gonna be a, a time where we would um, go with the Supreme Court's recent trend, that would be it. Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk to Senator Kitchell about the money for independent college PPE and testing. Jim is going to send us all a new draft with the few changes we made to the select committee. The um, HVAC stuff is already with the appropriations committee. And so those changes will get made. Am I forgetting anything immediate? Okay. Um, so let's uh, work on that. And um, if I have any questions, I'll, I'll email back, but I think that's all pretty clear. I'll try to write everybody an email after I talk with Senator Kitchell, just clarifying the, the independent college stuff. Okay. All right, have a great afternoon and see you all soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.